Welcome to Entanglement Radio on the Conversations from the Brink Network. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and this show is all about the potential and possibilities of what it means to be human. I have a great guest for you today. We have the co-founder of uh, A Course in Mastering Alchemy, Jim Self, and uh, we are going to be talking about what that is about, um, learn a little bit more about how we show up in the world, understanding that maybe some of our thoughts and beliefs don't really belong to us, and we'll explore that a little bit more, and uh, what we can do in this very tumultuous time to kind of navigate our world without so much maybe fear and panic. There's a lot of frantic energy out there. Coming up next week, we have David Barnes, and we're going to be talking about sacred economics and how we can um, explore different ideas about our commerce and how we can use it in uh, in more in alignment with our our purpose and where we'd like to go uh, in this world. So that will be next week. If you'd like to know more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to AngelaLevesque.com. If you'd like to know more about the show, Entanglement Radio, uh, you can find out more about that at conversationsfromthebrink.com, which is a multimedia hub that provides insight and inspiration for humanity's next step. Um, Yeah, so let me introduce my guest. Jim Self is the co-founder of A Course in Mastering Alchemy and an international speaker and author. He has been leading seminars and teaching healing, clairvoyance, and personal energy management courses since 1980. Since childhood, he's retained a conscious awareness and ability to recall his experiences within the sleep state. Over the last 12 years, this awareness has expanded into relationships with the archangels, ascended masters, and teachers, and teachers of light. The tools and information presented in Mastering Alchemy programs is a co-creation of these relationships. So with that, I feel very honored and blessed to welcome Jim Self to the program. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Very good, Angela. Nice to be here with you. Yes, it's nice to have a, a local Boise in as well. There's a lot of uh, really cool uh, and talented individuals in our community. So I'm glad to have another on the program. So let's start at the very beginning, as uh, as I just read in your bio, that you have been doing this work since 1980. So that is a large body of work. And I was just wondering if you could give us a glimpse into how um, A Course in Mastering Alchemy began. Well, there's, uh, in, in my life, I've always had lots of uh, interactions in ways that most people would consider different um, conversations with the archangelics, although at the beginning it was not clear who I was having conversations with. And many people have that. It's just those interactive thoughts you have in your head. But all through uh, my life, my awareness in terms of intuition has been very prevalent. And and as many people, as they have these experiences growing up, they shut them down where they're told to shut them down. Uh, There really isn't angels or beings or playmates sitting at the table when you're two years old and the parent says, you know, stop that or stop lying, stop making up stories. And most people shut down their intuitive skill sets, which are extremely valuable, but we shut them down. And we make a decision that instead of kind of going in this internal guidance system that we all have, that we're following from childhood, we begin to move our attention externally to the mom, dad, teacher, minister of life. And because that's all we really know, we just assume that's all truth. And so we begin to craft our life based on what we're told. And a lot of what we're told is do this, don't do that, good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't talk to these people, don't talk to those people. We go to these schools, we don't go to those schools. So that crafting of a personality is something that is very dependent on the external world. In my reality, even though that was my exposure also, I didn't really give up the internal world. And so I just allowed these awarenesses. And most of the awarenesses especially as I got older, began to be something where I could trust my internal guidance system and awareness to be more accurate than some of the external aspects of what I was experiencing. And that just continued to flourish and develop throughout um, 
kind of a large set of activities uh, in terms of businesses and politics and and developing international type of activities that I play in. So kind of a foot in both worlds, but that ultimately led to how do you manage yourself? How do you manage the energy of your thoughts, your emotions, your reactions, your observations, your choices? And that's kind of what led to Mastering Alchemy. One of the things that I think is interesting is I, too, had a very similar experience um, growing up that there was things that I was aware of or could see or conversations I could have. And I, too, uh, grew up in a in a family where that was um, very much shut down. So I was wondering, was there people along the way for you that a- assisted you in nurturing um, these aspects of yourself? Or was this kind of a, a self-taught journey as, as you kind of grew up? No, it was self-taught to a great extent. But in 19, about 1979, 1980, I had a... Um, a lot of my ex- my intuition was really turning on in some very significant ways, and I was really fortunate to um, find a place. I lived in Northern California, and there was a place called the Berkeley Psychic Institute, and um, and I thought, well, I'll just go there and see what's going on. And in the process of doing that, it became really clear that what they were doing and saying was what I had been living. And in that process, I spent a good amount of time at the Berkeley Psych Institute. I don't say that out loud often, but um, and then wound up teaching there and really had a couple of very interesting people that were extremely capable and uh, wonderful people. And so that allowed me kind of a setting to really spend a lot of individual time in, in beginning to have these understandings. And then about 1998 or so, um, I was I kind of left Northern California and um, started kind of playing much more so. And in the course of the next couple of years, these conversations that I have with these different levels of consciousness, which I'm going to loosely call the archangels and the ascended masters, lords of light, these are all levels of consciousness we kind of call we name them you know metatron and and uh, gabriel and Raphael in terms of uh, beings that kind of are names but it, it really is different in these upper realms but basically just going by those names there was a number of conversations that started out with there's a path that we see that's possible to kind of move humanity into a direction that um, is opportunistic at this, this time. And that path is, this path particularly, as it's going to be constructed, has never been walked before. It's about your own personal ascension, or a more comfortable world for some is your own evolution into a higher level of consciousness. How to elevate the earth back to the state of being that it once was before it fell. And opening a doorway for humanity to step into a fifth and multidimensional consciousness. And there was a pause. And then the question was, would you like to play here with us? And that's what created this whole uh, adventure of mastering alchemy. And so would I be correct in is somebody who's done this work that has spanned decades, do you feel that this is uh, that more and more people, have you seen a trend of uh, more and more people coming and just inviting in this work and this information and those um, higher aspects of consciousness? Are we ripe for this right at this time? Is this a unique uh, moment in, in our personal evolution and global evolution? Absolutely. But it, so this, what I just said, mastering alchemy, is just a, a chunk of something that's much greater. There's, you know, people have been saying there's going to be a shift in consciousness, uh, uh, a moment that'll occur where things begin to really change. Well, that was very real. And it was pointed out that in about 2012, something was going to happen. Well, in 2012, something did happen. Now, 2012 came and went and just like, you know, Y2K back at the turn of the century where everybody said, you know, one minute after midnight, 
you know, all the computers in the world are going to shut down and everything's going to change. And, and that didn't happen. Well, actually it kind of happened, but it didn't happen in the average person's awareness. Same thing with 2012. You know, people woke up the next day and said, the yep, sun came up again, nothing must have happened. But in fact, this shift in consciousness is very much like a reset in a computer. And this reset is enormous. And the reset, it's as if you've now just stuck a new operating system into the computer. And then in 2012, 13, 14, it was almost said, hold on a second. Let's turn the computer off for one split second and then reboot it in 2012. And then hang out here with me because we're going to kind of let it settle in for a moment and and establish its own foundation. And so over the last number of years, that reset has been in motion. But it's, you'd be hard-pressed to ask anybody, and I mean literally anybody today, even very unconscious people, if you have a sense of something's changing. Is there something different going on that you feel inside you? Not that you think in your head, but you feel. Is there something different? And virtually everybody will say yes. Now, they don't know what they're talking about and means what that means, but now you're beginning to see this transition that is in place, and that's that anxiety and fear we'll talk about in a few minutes that a lot of people have for appropriate reasons and inappropriate reasons. They are holding on to this anxiety, but in simple terms, you're in a, you've grown up in a, we'll call it a third dimensional reality. And in that reality, there are, in in dimensions, there are rules and structures to each one of these dimensions. And in the third dimension, you have a number of things that people don't even question. For example, in the third dimension, you have an aspect of time that is just a given to the average person, past, present, future, then you die. That's how it is. End of discussion. Well, it's actually not how it is. Time is an application, not a fixed concept. But in the third dimension, you also have these dualities, good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't. And in third dimension, you have a level of fear and you have reaction, meaning people are responding to things that happened in their past and they hope they don't happen in their future or I I was told in my past that if I did this my future would look like this so we spend very little time in present time but when something happens that's not supposed to happen we're very much present right now and it's a reaction it's like oh my god this isn't supposed to happen and there's more to that but if you just think about that That's pretty much how we live our life. And the piece in third dimension is in order for me to be basically okay with myself, I need an external approval. At the job, at my relationship, by the grade I get in school, et cetera, et cetera. Do I wear the right clothes? Is my makeup right? Do I have the right hair? Am I playing properly on social media? Am I valued by the external world? When you start to to understand that, and in this shift of consciousness, you're moving from that state of external world to a state that is much more internal. And so in this transition, you can't take your baggage with you. You can't take I'm not okay. And most of the I'm not okay is structured because they didn't like me. They didn't approve of me. Somebody said, what's wrong with you and handed you that statement. And then we walk around for the rest of our life trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Well, and nothing's wrong with me. Somebody just had a bad day one day and blurted out what's wrong with you. And you took it personally. So you can't take that what's wrong with you. It's impossible to be not okay. It's absolutely impossible to not be okay. But Because so many in our external world say you're not okay, and then we try to figure out what did I do, you really never get grounded, get centered, kind of find yourself, get quiet in present time where you can observe, then choose how you wish to engage with the world on your terms. 
So that's a transitional consciousness that moves you into a higher state of awareness. And this is what this whole journey is. So let's just call it everybody's going into a fifth dimensional state of consciousness, whatever that word means, just a, a label. But fifth dimension is a very state of well-being, co-creation, cooperation, beauty, grace, dignity, respect, appreciation, gratitude, and all of those kind of words. In that fifth dimensional space, there is no fear. There is a word like safety doesn't exist because there's nothing that's unsafe. And you start to find in that when you begin to think about beauty and well-being and respect, all of a sudden you say those words to somebody and they smile. And so, well, what is that smile? That smile is really a place where inside they say, oh, I know. Oh, that's what I want. That's what I've always believed in. I, I want to see that world unfold. And so that's what this shift is all about, moving into that world without your baggage. However, some assembly required. <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not a pure gift. You have to pay attention. You have to make a set of decisions. And some of those decisions are, do you continue to hold on to what mom, dad, teacher, minister, and your best friend said once upon a time? Or do you want to take a breath and decide, I'm okay? And so there's a, there's there's some work to be done, and now that's what Mastering Alchemy is all about. How do you create a platform for an individual to be able to step out of the fear, and I'm not okay, into a place where they can begin to experience for themselves a sense of certainty, capableness, graciousness, a sense of commanding their presence, and very much a sense of seniority. This is who I am. In order to do that, you have to create a safe place for people to begin to experiment, playing with what would it feel like if nobody knew I was okay. And that's what Mastering Alchemy is all about. Well, I want to ask you a little bit more about this fifth dimensional space. And I understand um, on one, you know, because... I've done a lot of reading and I've interviewed quite a different people, a few different people, and we've talked about this. But from this place of the individual living, you know, I'm okay, I'm capable, I'm filled with grace. What does the world around us look like? Do we still have jobs or, you know, are we still going and, and paying our bills and interacting? Or does that fundamentally shift our outer worlds? And the reason that I'm, I'm bringing this up is because I do, I, I feel like you and I've talked to enough people that feel that we are in this shift and yet we have such um, a dichotomy going on right now when you look at the expression of fear and hate and anxiety and just that incredible divide that we're seeing, especially in the United States, but I would say worldwide as well. Like I'm trying to figure out doing this inner work and then what does that look out, look like outwardly and why are we going through this process right now with such um, extremes and uh, polarity? Yeah, great question. So I said earlier, you can't take your baggage with you. On this journey. And so the external world is very much a reflection of everybody's internal world. Those fears, those competitions, those aggressions, those concept of I got to find advantage in order to be better than to be successful. I have to have some level of advantage, competition, very ugly words. But that's the nature of how we understand interacting with the world around us. So with this reset in the great spiritual computer, you can't take your baggage with you. And so as this day is dawning, in a way, this level of light is being shown into that world, if you would, metaphorically. And what happens is the status quo of how everybody walks around in their preconceived, preconstructed life of protecting themselves, hiding because we all do this very well, even mostly from ourselves, those statements of I'm not OK. So, you know, you're you you have a situation where you're you're a, 
a 13-year-old girl, a freshman in high school, and you're trying to socialize and you've got all that sexual energy starting to run through you and you're really not sure what's going on and you're trying to fit in and you hanging out with a number of girls and you tell a funny joke and instead of them laughing with you, they laugh at you. Devastating. Mm-hmm. Now, it could be a boy, it could be a girl. I'm just using an example. Devastating. And so all of a sudden I have this, they laughed at me. I'm not okay. Now, you can't carry that around very long because it's just eats you alive. Think about that state in your own existence. And so you do something very specific. You finally put it into a little box over here, let's say on the left side, that's called denial. Hmm. I'm okay. That didn't really happen. But yet it keeps nagging at you. So then you make another decision. This is kind of the fundamentals of this energy. And you say, look, little box over here, I know they laughed at me, but I'm never going to go over there by those girls again. And and as long as I don't go over there, let's put you back here in unconsciousness. And if you don't come out into the light of day, I'll never go over there by those girls. And it says, fine. Now, if you never go over, it changes this, the conversation. OK, I'll be quiet back here where you, and I won't ever come out and bite you in the butt. But you can't go over there where you got embarrassed. And all of a sudden the person says, OK, so I don't hang out with those girls. And it happens again with those boys. And then it happens again on the job. And then it happens again. And pretty soon I have all these denied limitations that are structuring my personality. I'm not OK. I can't play over there. I can't do this. I'm afraid to go out the house. Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. So in everybody's life, we have that construct. That's a third dimensional structure. I am afraid of being told I'm not okay. But you got this big backpack that we carry around that's full of that. And you can't take your baggage with you on this journey. So the world is beginning to have the universe is totally on your side. And it says, hey, let me help you out. We're going to if you can get happy, I'll make a deal with you. All that stuff that you think is bad about you, we'll just clean it out of the backpack. But you have to get happy. Well, for a person who's unhappy, getting happy is a transition. And I don't know how to get happy. I haven't been happy for a long time. I'm afraid if I try to get happy, what's in my back is going to come out and bite me. And so the light's shining and everybody's backpack is being cleared out. Most of the, what's in there you don't even is not even yours. And it's being cleared out. But it's disruptive. And so we are in a very disruptive environment. And in my simplest way, you can't take your baggage with you. So when you multiply that out to 7 billion people and the status quo of of how things work or the hidden agendas of how things work, the financial system, the banking systems, the governmental systems, the industrial military systems, the media systems, they all have their structures of off-balanceness. They all have their hidden secrets. All that doesn't work in a free society, in a society where everything moves smoothly. Fifth dimension. So you're watching the turmoil of the status quos being broken down. Now, the question you ask is really an important one is, how do you move through that without getting it all over you? Hmm. And and so so what you're watching right now, if you take a look at Take Donald Trump as an I – it's hard to separate the personality because the personality is what's bringing about the change. But here, a lot of people are seeing disrespect, bullying, obnoxiousness, a, a man who just says, I don't care. I'm going to do it my way, an egotistical kind of maniac in, that can't get past the fact that he really lost the election or, and he has to go into – a structure of basically defending something that is not defendable. And so it keeps making up stories. Well, that in itself is extraordinarily disruptive to the average person who understands appropriateness, understands you don't really lie. You don't make up stories. You don't do. And then you elevate it to that level of position of status and importance. And you're watching all of this unfold things that this man does. You wouldn't have your kids do. And so extremely disruptive. Now, back away from it a little bit and put it in the context of 
everything is being disrupted. You can't take your baggage with you. So in a way, you get a person like this that's glaringly disrupting the system. It's forcing everybody to step back and say, what am I about? Now, there's great I mean, there's going to be a lot of very good news out of the, the Donald Trump in this state of disruption. In, on the positive side, he actually is going to do some very, very beneficial things, I'm kind of projecting what I'm aware of in the future. And he's going to also come under massive attack. But one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to see a unity consciousness unfold very similar to what happened in 1968, 1969. And with regard to the Vietnam War, where people finally stood up and said, enough, this is not acceptable. And it changed the direction of everything. That's about to happen here. So to people who are in a lot of anxiety, one of the things that I would say that that may give you a little bit of pause and sense of opportunity and well-being is there is going to be a tremendous groundswell that basically says – Yes, things aren't right, and I've been living with them, not uh, allowing them to be not right and not knowing how to participate. But you get that Women's March the day after the election. That's going to turn into something extremely significant. And people around the world are going to start to look at how they do things and realize, yeah, we really do have to change this. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to be very disruptive for the next couple of years. But – under the surface, this sense of well-being and appropriateness that's driven from this internal guidance system in the heart is now beginning to take hold. And you're going to see it in, in and amongst the disruptiveness. That's the loud noise, but the subtleties underneath the surface. And so in a way, you're beginning to create two earths, two stratas of consciousness, one of fear and kind of, I got to do the same thing and they'll dig in their heels and they'll argue and fight and there'll be wars and all those things in that earth. And then this level where you and I and everyone listening to this basically says there's another way. And that other way will begin to be relevant and begin to be real. And it's almost as if you're going to have a division and that lower, lesser division of anger and resentment and holding on to in mind, you know, that is going to be unaware of this greater evolution of consciousness that's unfolding. It's going to take a little time. It's going to be disruptive. But to the individual, if you can begin to realize, if you take, a, if you can get into present time and you can just simply pause and look at this, one of the things that you can begin to realize is what you're looking at has very, very, very little to do with you. All that noise out there has very little to do with who you are and it's noise. So who do you want to be? How do you want to experience your life without putting your finger in all those light sockets that are out there that are charged? Would you suggest then that we ignore that noise or do you think it's important to still stay informed and see what's happening? Or do you just say, let's turn ourselves inward and work, you know, release ourselves of that baggage? No, it's not an ignoring and it's not a uh, it's not a turning your back on it. And it's not a just simply saying, well, it really doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. No, it's going on all around you. The key is kind of that adage that says in the world, but not of the world, you know, walking through the valley of shadow of death without fearing the evil of it all. No, you're in it. It's real. It's all around you. You're going to see it everywhere. But do you but can you walk through it? Can you allow the obnoxiousness without pulling it in and running it through your own energy system? See, those are vibrations that don't feel very good. And so kind of in mastering alchemy, there's some really fundamental, simple energy management tools that allow you to basically create a concept of discernment from the edge of the aura. We'll talk about that if you like a little bit to my heart is me. This is me. If you kind of draw a circle around you and call you call that your aura, people understand that and pull your energy inside that and stand there and look to, to the outside. This is me. And everything on the other side of this point of discernment 
is Shakespeare's theater to entertain me. Mm -hmm. I mean, what an interesting concept. Entertain me. That's all out there for my entertainment, my well-being, my opportunity, my learning, etc. And I can choose to engage with it or not. But when there's no discernment, the energies of fear and disruption are moving right through your energy field. And this is where we say <clears throat> most of the thoughts you think, most of the beliefs that you hold are not yours. They're not even yours. So when you can begin to stop and pause in present time and discern, does this have value to me? What I believe, does it have any value to anything? Or is it just a, a pattern of, of noise, vibration running through my space? And so when you begin to put your attention on some of these things that you just believe but never examined, all of a sudden they start to fall away. It's baggage. It's somebody else's thoughts that you just went, okay, me too. But now you're more mature. You're not seven years old anymore. You're not going to that church anymore. You're not in that political system anymore. You're not at that school anymore. Does it make sense? I don't like those people. Well, why? Well, they told me. But do you know those people? Well, no. All of a sudden you examine your own internal structures. You realize that the engagement points are not even yours many times. Hmm. I like that. Uh, I want to talk just really briefly because I think it's a good example of um, – a way a concept from mastering alchemy can really change the way that you show up in the world. And you ch spoke briefly on it, but you talked about time. Um, and I, when I was listening to you speak the other day at the workshop, you said time and space moves through us. We don't move through time. And you'd mentioned here that it, it becomes an application and not a fixed constant. So yes. how does something like that yes. alter the way that uh, our sense of reality or the way that we show up in the world? Well, let's take sense of reality. So what is your reality? Well, I, they told me this. I went to this school. I learned these things. And if I apply them in my future point, I will be successful or I will get in trouble, depending on how you construct that. But see, what happens is that's a moving belief system that moves from past to future. You don't live in the past and you don't live in the future. And so you take all that information and you're running it through your body and you're predetermining what your future is going to be and you're leaning into the future. What, what are you going – I mean it's like everything we do is leaning into a future place. But if, if you can get into present time, you can get a reality that basically says, OK, I have all of this awareness and does it have value to me? So when you get into present time – Let's take one thing. Let's take that little girl who wound up getting embarrassed because she told a joke and then got laughed at. In present time, that woman now is going to stop and recognize that my life is being driven by this level of fear. But if you said to her, well, have you ever told a joke again? In that context, you'd say no. And then everybody sitting around would laugh out loud and say, wait, you're so funny. You're always telling jokes. But in her belief system, I can't do that. And all of a sudden you begin bring it into present time and you realize, wow, that's true. I'm, I'm funny and I'm happy and I'm telling jokes and people like me. The minute you get in present time to that reality, that old pattern of I'm not okay dissolves. You let it go. It's not a, any doesn't have any value. So if you could bring yourself into present time and walk around all of those emotional baggage that we all hold, you would find that a very large percentage of them, 95, 98 percent of them have absolutely nothing to do with you today. And the other two percent is something you could deal with in different in, in a different manner of looking at it. But once you get into present time, you start to realize things like the emotion I'm holding that keeps me from going into talking and, and experiencing life the way I want it is really a fundamental structure of my past emotional structure. When you step into present time, one of the things you can begin to realize is my past is simply information. It is not emotion. 
emotion only happens now. So I say to you, how are you? And you're, you kind of go, well, I'm okay. Well, that doesn't sound like okay. What's going on? And you say, well, my husband, wife died 25 years ago and I'm sad. Oh, interesting. So they're holding an emotion, tying it to a event 25 years ago, but the emotion is determining how they're moving around in their life today. And if you change that subject and you say, well, how was dinner last night? Oh, it was great. It was really fun. Well, wait a minute. What happened to sad? Well, I moved out of sad. So your hist- your information, your history, your past is really simply information to choose from right now how you would like to engage your next couple of present time moments in front of you. So you you create a body of awareness that allows you to choose how you would like to engage in your world rather than reactionary responses to moving into your future. So present time begins to allow you tremendous range. And if I made it as simple as I can, you only exist in present time. You can't choose to live a past moment in the change a past moment in the past or create a future in the future. But from the information you have of your past right now, you can very clearly architect your future by recognizing, what do I do now? Now, what do I do now? What do I do? Those first nows are now in the past. And so in the present moment, how would I like to experience my future? And you begin to very clearly construct it. That's Mm -hmm. a very different way of thinking from third dimensional past future thinking. Yes, thank you for that because that's a, a great example of. Um, I mean, your your program is very in depth and not something that we can do <laughs> justice in thirty five minutes. But um, I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, I should mention to my listeners that you have a huge amount of free resources, energy management tools. There's just so much that you can do, um, and then of course taking the the actual program. So I want to give you the opportunity to share uh, how listeners can connect with you, your website, and anything you'd like to leave them with today. Sure. Well, it's MasteringAlchemy.com. And our business model, in effect, the whole process of what we do is to provide substantive information. So we give away a lot of free information. And our logic is we're never going to see you. I'm never going to see you again. So I want to give you a set of tools or a set of opportunities, information that allow you to hang up the phone if it was a free webinar, which we do lots of those. And Go live your life. I'm never going to see you again. But at the same context, I want to give you substantive information so that you can make a decision that says, I want to know how to do this in present time, how to live in certainty, commanding a presence, having a sense of seniority about myself, and recognizing that I can step into well-being and enjoy being happy now in this minute. And so there is Mastering Alchemy has a a level one, a level two, a level three kind of component to it. But each one of them is about tools and actions to construct yourself and walk through that world out there without getting it all over you. And so, uh, but it goes more than that. It's really takes you into a place where things that people don't have any clue about is like we talk about the mental body and the emotional body and the spiritual body. Well, that mental and emotional body were never meant to be two bodies, And so when you can begin to clear away your past in these belief systems, these thoughts you hold that aren't yours, that mental and emotional body begin to be one. And in that place, you can have a thought and choose an emotion to go along with that thought rather than having an experience and saying, oh, this really makes me angry. And then wham, you wind up in an emotion that maybe you really wanted to be in, but maybe you didn't want to be in. But it's done unconsciously. And then it's reactionary. Would you like to be able to choose how do I really want to engage in this situation when my husband, wife says something that's kind of off the mark and, well, I'm really angry. Well, are you really angry? Or is it like, well, that was a silly thing to say. And then you reconstruct the conversation in a manner that allows everybody to kind of save face or to step out of the awkwardness without it being awkward and then they're being, well, I'm never going to talk to that person again, which is something we do in third dimension. Well, thank you. Mention your, your website address again. 
selfmasteringalchemy.com. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim. Um, There's just so much value to the work that you do. And thank you for bringing it um, and being out in the world in the way that you are. And I really enjoyed our conversation today. I enjoyed the conversation also. Blessings. Have a great day. I appreciate it. You too. All right. Coming up next week, we have David Barnes, and we're going to be talking about sacred economics, how we bring our uh, values, beliefs, and spirituality into um, the way into our commerce. So if you'd like to know more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to AngelaLevesque.com. If you'd like to find out more about Entanglement Radio or my project, Conversations from the Brink, you can go to ConversationsForTheBrink.com, and you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter at Hestia Health. Well, that's the show for today. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week. <laughs>